Good morning as we're finding our places this morning even though it's a little bit gray and I saw some rain coming down which is much needed. 473, oh what a wonderful, wonderful day. Day I will never forget. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. 473, standing as we sing. Oh what a wonderful, wonderful day. Day I will never forget. After I'd wandered in darkness away, Jesus my Savior I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend, He met the need of my heart. Shadows is falling with joy, I am telling, He made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day, and glory filled my soul. Born of the Spirit with life from above, into God's family divine, Justified fully through Calvary's love, oh, what a standing is mine. And the transaction so quickly was made, when as a sinner I came. Took of the offer of grace, he did proffer, he saved me, oh, praise his dear name. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross, behold, my sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. Whoa, 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 whoa. You're, you're working so hard here that, see, I know you could smile here. Amen. Glory filled my soul. It ought to make it up to your face. Oh, that's right. All right. Amen. Okay. Here we go on the last. Now I have a hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure. There in those mansions of life. And it's because of that wonderful day when at the cross I believe. Rich is eternal when blessings from his blessed hand I receive. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Some of you are getting it. There we go. When at the cross the Savior made me whole. Think of this. My sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Over to 308. I'm pressing on the upward way. Higher ground. 308, please. <laughs> I'm pressing on. Upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay Where doubts arise and fears dismay Though some may dwell where these abound My prayer, my aim is higher ground Lord, lift me up and let me stand A higher plane than I have found Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to live above the world, though 
Satan's darts at me are hurled. For faith has caught the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to scale the utmost height and catch a gleam of glory bright, but still I'll pray till heaven I found. Your ground, Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Amen. Amen. You know, that song says in the third verse that we just sang Satan's darts at me are hurled. If you are walking with God, that is going to happen. Amen. So what do you do? Poke them out, throw them on the ground, throw them on there, keep charging forward. Amen. That's what we have to do. Don't faint. Don't fail, falter. Stay with it. God will bless you for it. And his power is what will take us through. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time this morning. Father, we ask that you might meet with us this morning as we look into your word. And Father, you have something for everyone here this morning. No one is here by accident. Everyone has come by divine appointment. You set their lives in such a way this morning that they could be here. And Father, we're thankful that you brought them in. And so Father, we ask that you might just glorify your name through the preaching of thy word, through the songs and all that takes place this morning. Father, we simply want to glorify you in all that we do. So help us this morning, Father, as we have our service together, as we worship you, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. Doesn't seem possible, but May is coming quickly to an end this Sunday, and Lord willing, next Sunday, last two opportunities to sing our song of the month before the throne of God above. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love. Whoever lives and pleads for me, my name is graven on his hands, my name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart, no tongue can bid me thence depart. When Satan tempts me to despair And tells me of the guilt within Upward I look and find him there Who made an end to all my sin Because a sinless Savior died My sinful soul is counted free For God the just satisfied to look on him and pardon me to look on him and pardon me hold him there the risen lamb my perfect spotless righteousness the great unchangeable I am the king of glory and of grace one with himself I cannot die my soul is purchased by his blood my life is hid with Christ on high with Christ my Savior and my God with Christ my Savior and my God Amen. We have another opportunity to give back to the Lord. Michael Benjamin, would you come and receive our offering this morning? God loves a cheerful giver. Brother Michael. Dear Lord, please bless this day, bless the service, and the pastors about the youth message. Lord, help us to get through this COVID, and please bless this offering, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Just before Pastor comes with a message this morning, a song of testimony, 483. Would you stand as we sing, Oh, How I Love Jesus. 483. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood that sinners perfectly. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells me what my Father had in store for every day, and though I tread a darksome path, you sunshine all the way. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe, who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus. Thank you, may be seated. Amen. Take your Bibles open to the book of Romans. Romans chapter number 12. Last week I preached a message on the Bible doctrine of the will of God. God's specific will is found throughout the Bible in many different lives of people called out by name by the Word of God. And over the years, I have heard many messages preached that taught on various Bible subjects and Bible doctrines, what we're responsible to be, what we're responsible to do in order that we may be right with God. However, many times I've been told what to do but not how to do it. So this morning I want to preach a message to you on the general will of God. Next Sunday, Lord willing, I'm going to talk about the specific will of God. But when we think about the will of God, there's probably nothing as important for every Christian in the Bible as the will of God is to you. God has something specific for every one of us to do. We'll talk more about that next week, but he also has a general will, which is applicable to every believer. Uh, regardless of where you live, where you come from, how long you've been saved, he has a general will for you. And it's a biblical certainty that the will of God, this doctrine is in the Bible. Although I've heard many say over the years, well, I don't put too much stock in that. You know, I don't think God calls people to this or that. I don't think he really, we just have to do what God says. But no, there is a will of God for your life, a general will of God for every believer. And there is a specific will of God for every believer. So this morning, I want to speak to you on the general will. And I want to tell you what the difference is between a general will of God and a specific will of God. And uh, if you don't hear any of the messages that I preach, I'm telling you, you had better listen close to this because this is important to every believer this morning. And so it is, it, is it possible to be in the general will of God and not be in the specific will of God? Absolutely. You can be specifically out of God's will while still being in the general will of God. And we'll tell you about that in a minute. But 
We told you last week and gave you a few examples of how God spoke directly to certain individuals and He clearly stated audibly or through messengers, through prophets, through dreams, uh, and many other ways to a person as to what He wanted from that specific person. And uh, we see that throughout the Scripture. But I want to begin today with the understanding between what God's general will is for us and what His specific will is. And by the way, I said earlier, He has a specific will for every believer. It's not just for pastors or Sunday school teachers. It's for every believer. But this morning, I want to focus on the general will of God. Uh, so let's answer the question, how can I be in the general will of God for my life? God's general will is for all people. It makes no difference uh, who you are. His general instructions for us apply to each and every believer. Here's one. Salvation is the first Bible step for a person to enter the general will of God for their life. That has to be first. It's, it's, it's the foundation for everything that we are as a Christian. Example is this, uh, Romans uh, chapter 3, verse 20. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That is a universal problem for all mankind when they're born. We talked about that on Wednesday night. It makes no difference who you are. Nobody is born in sinless perfection. Whether you're the Roman Catholic or not, it makes no difference. You are born with a sin nature. God says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Hallelujah for that. Amen. Amen. His general will is following, it, it, that, that follows salvation. Uh, salvation must be first. And so God's will for all mankind is that they are saved. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That is God's will for all mankind. doesn't matter who you are. God's general will says that God wants all to be saved. Anyone who enters hell goes against God's will for their life. God didn't create hell for we human beings. He created hell for the devil and his angels. But uh, let me just say, man will end up there if he rejects the teaching of the Word of God. Because of man's free will, he has the ability to either choose to uh, accept God's perfect gift of salvation or reject it. It's not God's plan for any man to end up in hell. And if a man refuses to be saved, it's impossible for him to know God's will and for him to be pleasing in God's sight. We have people tell us all the time as Christians, as we go out and we talk about church and religious and spiritual things, they'll say this, well, you know, I have my way of doing things. I worship God in my way. Can I tell you this morning that if that's your thought process and it doesn't line up with the word of God, you are out of the will of God. Man cannot determine the consequences of not accepting Christ. God has consequences for rejecting or not choosing Him. Every decision we make, by the way, as humans, comes with a consequence. Every decision has a consequence. Some of those are good, but some are not so good. And if a man rejects the person of the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and goes to death without being saved, he will suffer God's consequences. Rejecting God's God, uh, by the way, brings consequences of an eternity of a, in the lake of fire. That's what the Bible says very clearly. Many think that a man thinks he can go it alone and still be in good graces with God. I just told you a minute ago how some people say, well, no, that church thing is not for me. I worship God my own way. And, you know, when I want to get alone with God and I want to worship him, I head out into the wilderness and into the woods and I just, you know, spend time out there. Hey, that's a good thing. It is good to get outside of the city limits and get out where it's just peaceful and quiet. Nothing wrong with that. But that is not what God requires for every man to be in his general will. He requires salvation. This is how the sovereignty of God reacts, or excuse me, interacts with man's free will to choose good or evil. God called me 
to come and pastor Faith Baptist Church here in Winooski. However, he did not give that same call to everyone. That's specific to me. There was a specific will for my life. I believe that I'm in that specific will. But in Romans chapter 12, I ask you to find your place there in the beginning. We see more direction from God regarding his perfect will. Look with me at verse number one. It's a familiar verse. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Listen, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There you have it. Romans 12, 1 sets the tone for what what I believe must be first done in order to find the will of God for your life. It's here that most Christians, by the way, get tripped up. Right here in these verses that we just read. It's here that most Christians fall off the, fall off the path or get off on a wrong track. Why is that? Because they don't do what it says there in that verse, which it says there, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Here it is. Most, a lot of Christian folks will not lay themselves down. They want to still stand in the driver's seat. And let me just say to you this morning, if you want to be in the general will of God, you must lay yourself down and begin to submit yourself to the word of God. Since Christ did this for you and I, by the way, isn't it reasonable, reasonable for us to do the same? Christ gave, us, gave his life for all of us this morning. Every one of us that's here this morning that's a child of God that's been saved the Bible way and has a Bible reason to prove it. Christ died for you. Isn't it reasonable for us to be in the will of God? I think it is. Years ago, I had a friend in the church, and he was giving me his testimony, and he told me that when he first got saved, he had a problem. His problem came with him into his salvation experience. By the way, the moment that you're saved doesn't mean that you become perfect. You still sin. Amen? And uh, he had a besetting sin. His besetting sin was smoking. And he said, I hated it about myself when I first got saved. I knew it was not something God was pleased with. So he said, I tried and tried and tried. And uh, finally, God gave me the victory over it. He said, but let me just tell you, Pastor, he said, it wasn't easy. And those of you who have been smokers know it's not easy to lay down the cigarettes. But he said this to me. He said, you know, after I thought about it for being saved for a little while and I was still smoking and I wanted to get rid of it and I wanted to do away with that nasty habit, he said, I just came to the understanding. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 basically told me what I needed to know in order to lay it down. This is what he said. It's very profound. You've got to listen close. He said, I just thought it was reasonable. Amen. It's reasonable. The Bible says, which is your reasonable service. You know, these next steps that I'm going to give you this morning... Finding the general will of God for your life is this. Step number one, and by the way, this is assumes you're a child of God. Step number one in finding God's general will for your life is this. Surrender your will completely. Surrender your will. Stop fighting against God trying to do things in your life, trying to make you a new creature in Christ, trying to uh, conform you into the image of Christ. Just stop fighting. Lay yourself down. Surrender your will. And let me interject step number two real quick. Pray without ceasing. Praying as a Christian is a discipline that we Christians must, must, must be doing on a regular basis. It doesn't have to be fancy. You don't have to sit up there and, and make all kinds of flowery speeches. You just have to share your heart with God's heart. Be praying specifically for God to help you in areas of your life that you need help in. I remember years ago, you know, you've all been in church services before that when somebody is called upon to pray, they begin this long dissertation of 
flowery speeches and prayers. And, and we had a revival service one time at the church, and, and uh, it was going on and on and on. And it just seemed like it was a long service to begin with, the normal preaching part of it. And then the person that was doing the, the preaching that night said, Brother so-and-so, go ahead and close us in prayer. And he started to pray. And he prayed. And he prayed. And he prayed. And he prayed. He went on for almost five minutes. You say, well, come on, pastor. That's not very spiritual of you to not let the man pray. He was saying a lot to say nothing. It sounded very spiritual. But it wasn't really a heartfelt prayer. It was a, almost like a rehearsed, like he's singing a song or something. Hey, when we're praying specifically for God's will in our life and to, for us to see what God wants from us, we pray without ceasing. But please pray specifically. It doesn't have to be a whole flowery speech of a bunch of long words. We just have to be praying and asking God to give us the things that we need. Step number three. How about this? Look at Romans 12 verse uh, one again, it says there, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And here it is. Step number three, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Step number three is simple. Refuse to be conformed to this evil world. It's that simple. You know, that gives us the picture of being pressed into a mold. Remember several, maybe a year or so ago, two years ago, I brought a little box in, a little wooden box, and I asked you if you knew what it was. Remember that? It was a wooden box. And what was it? It was a butter mold. And you pour the, the creamy butter into this mold and let it harden up. And when it comes out, it has impressions on the butter, makes it fancy until the crumbs from the toast get in there. But that was a picture of being conformed and pressed into a mold. The world is trying to press you into a mold so that you will think like the world, act like the world, be like the world, talk like the world. And I'm telling you this morning, if you want to find the general will of God for your life and be in that, you must, you must, you must refuse to be conformed to this world. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, we see something interesting. Look there again with me. It says, and be not conformed to this world, but it says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There's something interesting here. At the end of that verse, the last part of the verse says that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Here God's will is divided into what is good, what is acceptable, and what is perfect. The general will of God is good for everyone. Doesn't matter who you are. Like we said earlier, it's God's will for all men to be saved. It's God's general will for every believer to be baptized. Christ commanded that in Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20. He said, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things, Whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. That was Jesus Christ himself telling us that we're to go and teach, bring folks to Christ, baptize them. Acts 2.41 in the early church shows us what happened in those early church days. It says, then they, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. God's general will for every believer is for you to be scripturally baptized. You know, the vast majority of the New Testament writing is aimed at the church. Not so much individuals, but the church. Why? The church is where God wants all believers to worship, fellowship, study, and learn. The church is God's institution. He created the church. The church is where God wants all believers to be, uh, willingly placing themselves under the authority of a local, visible assembly. And by the way, under pastoral leadership. 
The church is God's created institution, yet many pass the church off as unimportant. Something that isn't important. We have a lot of supposed modern day Christians today that won't come to a local independent Baptist church or a Bible believing church. And they'll say, I don't need to do that. I can stay home with my family and just do my own thing and da 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 da. And, and I'm just telling you, that is not God's general will for any Christian. Every Christian, if they want to be in the general will of God, will place themselves under the authority of a local Bible believing, Bible teaching church. It is the general will of God for every believer to study, to learn, and apply the Word of God to their life, and to be active in their local church. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15 tells us, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If this is not taking place in a believer's life, then he is not walking in the general will of God. It's that simple. I've had people tell me before, well, I don't like to read the Bible. I don't understand it. Well, maybe we should have a discussion on being born again. Yeah. Reading the Bible is not like a storybook, although there are some good, good uh, and interesting uh, narratives in the Bible. If, this is not play, if, if you're not studying the Bible on a regular basis, you're not in the will of God for your life, it is impossible to receive God's direction for living apart from the Word of God. Yes, you come to church and you hear the Word of God preached, but if you're not going to discipline yourself to study the Word of God away from church on a regular basis, you're not going to find the things that God wants you to find. They're in the Word. You'll surely never find God's specific will for your life if you're not a Bible student. That's where the specific will of God is found as we study and we're devoted to the Word of God. So step number four to finding the general will of God for your life is this. You must be studying God's book regularly. Not just on Sunday morning. You know the old joke? It's cloudy today because Christians got their Bibles out and they opened them up and all the dust came out. we got to be studying regularly, folks. we got to be in the Word of God on a regular basis. So assuming you've been born into the family of God, the Bible way, and you have a Bible reason to show it, let's review the steps again real quick to finding God's perfect will. Step number one, surrender your will completely. Step two, pray without ceasing. Step number three, refuse to be conformed to this evil world. Step four, study to show thyself approved. Now let's move on a little bit more. So far, all of those things that I've told you about the general will of God almost come pretty easily for most Christians. But when we get to step five, it gets a little harder to stay in the general will of God for your life. What is step five? Here it is. Grow in holiness and righteous living. Grow in holiness and righteous living. Look at Romans chapter 6. Hold your finger in chapter 12. Go over to chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Look at verse 19. The Bible says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. By the way, every one of us that, uh, that is carrying the flesh around, even after salvation, watch out. For as we have yielded our, your members, servants, to uncleanness and to iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now, here's what he says, yield your members, servants, to righteousness, unto holiness. See, what happens is when you start to live righteously, you become more holy, more separated, more sanctified. Uh, as we're saved, after we're saved, we're to allow the Spirit of God to continue to sanctify us unto holy living. This is a lifelong process. It'll end the moment that you see Christ. When you stand before Christ, the Bible says you'll see Him 
as he is, and you'll be like him. But uh, in the meantime, we're going through what is called a process of progressive sanctification. Little by little, as you follow the Word and you study the Word of God and you submit yourself to the will of God, you stay away from the world and being conformed to it, you begin, you begin to be sanctified a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. That's why when you're first saved, you still carry some of those sinful things into your life. And they stay with some of you for a while. I told you this before, but when I was first saved, I was a cusser. Being in the military and police work, I was a cusser. And it took God a while for him to remove those vocabularies from my, by my speech. And, and, and even after being saved for years, every once in a while, I'd still slip up, hit my thumb with a hammer. What about you? And by the way, there's a thing called Christian cussing. We got to stay away from that too. We just substitute the nasty words for words that don't sound, that sound a lot like them, but aren't the exact word. <laughs> Having a repentant spirit, by the way, is a lifelong Christian discipline. Repentance follows us through our Christian life. We've got to keep making up our mind as God reveals His truth from the Word of God to us. And as we see things, we continue to adapt ourselves to what God is saying for us to be and do. And that continues to be a process of repentance, changing our mind towards the things of God and coming into conformity with His, with his power and His authority of His Word. God's grace, by the way, many Christians have adopted this false theory that, hey, I'm saved, I'm under the blood, I'm in God's grace, and I can live independent of God any way I so choose because, hey, salvation is not of works, lest any man should boast. It's by Jesus Christ and putting faith and trust in Him alone. That's all I've got to do, and I can live any way I want after that. And you know what the sad part is? That's true. That's true. Salvation does not depend on anything we do. It is a free gift. But let me just tell you this. If you think that you can live and be effective and successful in all those things in your Christian life after being born again into the family of God and you reject the word of God and the teachings of God and you do whatever you want to do and you can do it in bliss and happiness and all those other things that the world talks about, Nothing could be further from the truth. God will allow it. But let me remind you of this. There will be consequences. There's such a thing in the Bible, a doctrine called the sin unto death. And if you run around on one day and you proclaim Christ and tell everybody how great Christ is and then you go out the rest of the week and live like the devil and you blaspheme the word of God and you bring discredit and disgrace to God and his word and to the person of Jesus Christ, you better watch out. Because God can take you out. Just like that. We're not guaranteed of anything. I know a lot of Christians who've just gone off into eternity. My former pastor in Virginia, his, his mother was a, a dear saint of God. She was the church pianist. And she was playing a hymn one Sunday morning in church. And she fell out right in the church. Just like that. Now, I'm not saying she was a sinful woman. But what I am saying is, God doesn't have to make a reservation for us to meet him. He can take us anytime He chooses. And if you're going to live a, a Christian life and you're going to bring discredit to the things of God and blaspheme God's name with your speech and your living, you better watch out because God can take you out anytime He chooses. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13 says this about our liberty, using our liberty for the wrong thing. For brethren, Paul said this, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. You've been set free. By the blood of Jesus Christ. But it says this. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. But by love. Here's what it says. Serve one another. Serve one another. You know in our Christian life that's what it's about. It's about service. God saved us to serve. Not serve self but to serve others. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 3, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. There are many other things contained in the general will of God for everyone. First of all, how about thankfulness? 
No, it's generally God's will for every believer to be thankful. To be thankful. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 tells us about that. But you know, sometimes we're not very thankful. Sometimes we're downright selfish. And we're discontent. God wants us to be thankful. If you're in His general will, you're going to be a thankful person. How about this? Good works. God wants His children to be about good works. According to 1 Peter chapter 2, and verse 15, God talks about good works for His children. How about this one? Enduring suffering. If you're going to be in the general will of God, you better mark her down. You are going to suffer. We sang this morning about the fiery darts of the devil. They're coming your way if you're serving. And if you're serving, you better be ready to endure some suffering. It is a part of your Christian life. 1 Peter 4 and verse 19. But I think it suffice to say... There is clearly a general will of God for everyone. The Bible spells out our responsibility to be in it. To find it and be in it, listen close, it merely is a studying of God's word. And you mark out with your pen, you take your highlighter, you take your, your red pen or whatever you want to do, and as you read through God's word and you see something that applies to a general believer, underline it, mark it down, highlight it, say, hey, that's for me. That's for me. Over here, that's for me. Yep, that's for me. That is how we get in the general will of God, by studying the Word of God. It's impossible to be in the general will of God if you're not in this book. It's impossible. You say, well, I just come to church and I just listen to Brother Dave Brunel. Well, that's important, but let me just say this to you. You have a responsibility to study to show thyself approved. That's what the Bible says. You know why it says that? You know why it doesn't say, hey, if you want to be in the general will of God, just listen to Brother Dave Burnell, listen to Pastor Glenn, listen to Tom Green, listen to Dave Roy and all the others who do their teaching. You know why he says for you, though, to study, to show thyself approved? This is going to shock you. But I could be wrong. Brother David could be wrong. Brother Tom could be wrong. Generally, I believe they're not, but let me just say it's possible. And when you stand before God, you can't say to God, well, by the way, I listened to Dave Brunell, and he told me this, this, and this, and I've done this, this, and this. He's not the authority. The Word of God is the authority. And that's why we have to study it to show ourselves approved. To find it, to be in it, is merely a studying of God's Word. You know, finding out what God says is our responsibility for living in this life. Finding it, and by the way, not just finding it, but practicing it. That means what we apply, what we learn. If God says to abstain from the appearance of evil, guess what that means? Abstain from the appearance of evil. Don't you do anything where somebody could look at you in an action that you're taking and say, Hey, boy, I'm not sure that's appropriate. You know, it doesn't seem right. We stay away. If the line is here, we don't stand right up next to it and live our life right here on the line. We stay away from it over here so that nobody can say, hey, he's walking close. That's why many young Christians get discouraged with church. You know why? Because they expect that we're going to live next to the line. And that's not what we're going to do. We're going to stay away from the line. That's why it's hard for folks to understand why we don't do certain things at the church house. As pastor of the church, it's up to me to guard and keep our church family as much away from that line as I can. And, and, and you know why? Because there's great blessings being over here and staying away from the line. You don't have to be a pastor or a Sunday school teacher to know God's general will for your life. You just simply have to be a Bible student. God doesn't make finding His will, I told you last Sunday, He doesn't make finding His general will for you so complicated, so dark, so mysterious, that you almost never find it and no Christian really ever finds the perfect will for his life. I don't believe that's true at all. God wants us to be in, first of all, His general will, 
And then he wants every one of us to be in the specific will that he has for you. You simply obey what is written, and every believer is responsible for those commands. Obedience to the general will of God is a daily decision. You know, there's some folks that get up on Sunday morning, and a family member calls and says, Hey, guess what? We just came to town. Can we stop by? You say, well, no, as a matter of fact, you can't stop by because I'm on my way to church. But here's what I'll do. I'll stop and pick you up. And we'll go together. Well, you know, we don't, we don't do church on Sunday. You say, well, I'll see you about 11 o'clock. That's what we need to be doing, folks. Things, we shouldn't let things take the, pre, take, take the place of being in the church house on Sunday morning. That is part of God's general will for every believer, to be in church. We must remember, no one's going to stand over you and make you obey. I've told you many times, I'm not going to follow you around throughout the week to make sure you're doing the things that you're supposed to do. My job is to tell you those things. My responsibility is to preach what thus saith the Lord, and it's up to you to either be in the will of God or not. Uh, but it must be a purposeful choice that you make every day. And this choice should not be because of fear of judgment. Every one of us here this morning probably remembers a time in your young life when you were growing up where your father said, if you do that, I'm going to crack you so hard. And guess what? I don't know about you, but when he said that to me, I tried my best not to do it. Because I didn't want dad's crack on my head. But that's not why we serve. That's not why we do the things that we do. We don't do them because we're afraid of God's judgment. Here's the reason. As a believer, you're fit for heaven because of the Lord Jesus Christ and his righteousness. You have, a, you have a reservation waiting for you. You have a mansion waiting for you in heaven. We don't do the things we do because we fear God in that sense. We should fear God. We should reverence His word and His commandments. But we don't do the things we do because we're afraid He's going to knock us over the head if we don't. I told you once before, God always pays. He doesn't always pay on Friday, but He always pays. There's always a consequence for our behavior. The choice should be made because, for this simple reason, because we love him. Because he first loved us. It should be motivated for our love for the Savior who gave his life for our liberty. Jesus gave this principle in Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40. He said this, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, this is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This was to be the standard for love. The standard for our love, it showed us clearly that we cannot love others the way we're supposed to because we don't love Christ the way we're supposed to. If you're squabbling with people all of the time as a believer, you're squabbling with your neighbors, you're squabbling with your boss, you're doing this, that, and the other thing, and you're an angry person, guess what? You're not loving God like you're supposed to. That's what happens when believers get out of sorts. They forget about what God's love means. It means to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and to love Christ first. And until you have that mastered, you cannot love another person the way you're supposed to. That's why anytime we do a wedding, we always require marital, premarital counseling to make sure, first of all, that the two people are believers. I'm not going to perform a wedding ever when one's a believer and one's not. I want to see that their testimony is what it should be and they can give a good account of themselves according to the word of God. Not that I'm their judge, but hey, let's face it, marriage is tough. We don't go into it with a bunch of baggage. We want to go into it where we know there's a great chance of success because we have two people who love God and they love Christ. Notice what Christ didn't say. In that verse that I just read, he said, love, 
Uh, he said, uh, uh, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all their heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. Not one time in that verse of Scripture in Matthew chapter number 22 did he say ever, you have to love yourself. See, that's what the world tells you. The world loves to tell people who are hurting. They love to tell people who are out of sorts on things, out of sorts with their home, out of sorts with their work, out of sorts with their family, their friends, their relatives, their children. The world loves to tell you, hey, you know why you'd have that problem? is because you're not loving yourself. That is the biggest, fattest lie of the devil I could ever hear. God never commands us anywhere in the Bible from cover to cover to love yourself. Matter of fact, it's the opposite. He tells us that our righteousness is as filthy rags. Everything in our life that's good, anything that is there uh, that we come to the, uh, the, the table with naturally, it's filthy rags. Only through Christ can we be what we're supposed to be. The only hope that man has of living a righteous and godly life is to be first born again and then submit themselves to the word of God. If my love for God is what it ought to be, then I will put God before others. And then I will be able to love others the way that I'm supposed to. I will place the needs of others before self. If I love God the way I'm supposed to and I, like, and I, and I love his commandments and they are not grievous to me, then I will respect authority. And I will be submissive to God's general will. I'll do the things that God tells me to do. God's general will is for every believer. Not one person who's been born into the family of God is exempt from following those general commandments. Are you walking in God's will this morning? Are you walking in His will for all believers? Are you doing the things that you read in the Bible? Are you marking your Bible and writing things down as you look and as you pray and as you study? Are you making a list of the things that you want God to do in your life? I hope so. Because that's all part of finding the general will for your life. And knowing these things, we'll talk more specifically next week about the specific will that he has for you. Did you know that God has a specific will for Tom Green? Something that he wants Tom Green to be doing for him? He has a specific will for him. And he has a specific will for you as well. Problem is most Christians don't ever give that much thought. They just go about their merry way and do their own thing and show up at the church on Sunday morning and go away the next week and come back the following Sunday and it just repeats, repeats. And I said to you last Sunday that I believe the majority of Christians that are in churches all over the country today are not in the specific will for God, or specific will of God that he has for them. Well, they might be following some of the general things, but the specific things, majority of Christians are not in that place. How do I know that? Because we still have empty seats in the church house. We still have a need for Sunday school teachers. We still have a need for people to hold an umbrella at the door when it's raining. We still have a need for somebody to pass out bulletins. We still have a need for, for men to stand up and, and protect our church family on Sunday morning when we're having service so that we can have service without thinking about somebody blasting through the front door and opening fire on our congregation. It's happening everywhere in our society today. And it's going to get worse. This world is on a collision course with a holy God. And the church stands between the lost world and God. And it's our responsibility to educate and to bring folks to Christ and then teach them that he has something specific for them to do. Next week I'll show you from God's word how you can find the specific and perfect will for your life. I hope you're in the will of God. It's probably the most important thing that you could do is find it and be in it. But we'll tell you more about that next week. Let's stand with our eyes closed for our time of invitation. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your word. 
Father, I thank you that you tell us so clearly the things that you want us to know. It's not secretive. It's not mysterious, Father. It's just simply about being in Christ first and then being in the Word and understanding the things that you have for us. Keeping us, Lord, close to you day by day. Praying specifically. Spending that quality time with you on a regular daily basis so that we can hear you speak when you do. There were men in the Bible, Father, that you give us, for example, that didn't hear you speak because they weren't in the place that they needed to be. Father, I pray this morning for our church and for our church family that we would be in that place so that we can hear you speak. Father, help us this morning as we pray. Convict hearts in Jesus' name.